The US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is meeting Benjamin Netanyahu uh, in Israel today. He'll be urging the Israeli Prime Minister to pause military operations in Gaza to get aid in and hostages out. Uh, we saw him earlier uh, talking to uh, the Israeli President, Isaac Herzog, uh, and he was making the point that things had to be done the right way, which is... Um, Kind of bold speaking, really, from uh, the Americans, because the Israelis, of course, taking the view uh, that nothing is really negotiable right now as long as Hamas is still in existence. Let's talk now, though, uh, to journalist Ami Horowitz, uh, who's here, of course, uh, with us for the first time live in uh, Israel. Uh, Ami, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And um, what a, a time to be in Israel. What's it like there at the moment, first of all? Yeah, indeed. It's... Uh... It's, it's crazy. Look, there, there's a chance that, that uh, while we're on air, I'm going to point out missiles coming toward Tel Aviv because that's what I've been experiencing every day that I've been here. Uh, probably 10 or 15 missiles per day. Uh, this is the kind of stress that Israelis have to live under uh, day to day at this point and, uh, frankly, for years. And by the way, I'm a pro. I will not leave this seat. Even if I see missiles coming down, <laughs> I will give you the situation on the ground. But um, joking aside, people are, it's, I've never, look, I've been in Tel Aviv many times. It's a jovial city. It's a fun city. It's an electric city. Uh, what you see is depression. People are sad. They are, restaurants and, and bars, which are normally full on a Thursday night and a Friday night are, are normally full, are just empty, dead, or closed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult time to be here, but I think it's an important time. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I spoke with somebody there um, who had been there just recently, who had just literally come back to London, who said that, you know, it's like a, a, a ghost town, you know, and it's a 24-7 city. Tel Aviv, I've never been there. It's one of the places I've always wanted to go. Lots of my friends have been there. It's, it's like a, uh, it's a beautiful place. It's vibrant. It's, it's got everything that you could expect to see in any kind of Western European city. And yet what people don't understand and what they don't get is that this, this, this bombardment of the rocket fire has been going on since everybody can remember, right? Yeah, this is, this is nothing new. Um, this has been going on since people can remember. Obviously, it's intensified uh, since the conflict began. Uh, and, and again, this is on the back of the slaughter of 1,400 Jews. Not just Jews, by the way. Actually, I'm, I'm wrong about that. Israeli Arabs and foreigners who were slaughtered in the most barbaric ways possible. Mike, they, there are new stories coming out all the time of the level of savagery that, that Israel faced. And every time I hear a new story, I think to myself, if I sat in a room and tried to conceive of something as sick as possible, I wouldn't have come up with what Hamas did to the Israelis on that day. Um, yeah, this is what they're dealing with on a daily basis. And, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the, the media, the world media has been just dreadful against Israel. They gave, they gave Israel 24 hours and that was it. They turned on Israel. Mm. And... You know, you keep saying, well, why aren't you giving them fuel? I don't understand. Why not? Mike, because that's why those missiles are flying, because they have fuel. Any fuel you give to them is not going to be given to the citizens of the, Pal the Gaza citizens, right? The, the Palestinian prisoners, because that's what they are. They're prisoners in their own country. No, they will be taken from them and used for weapons of war and terror. Mm. This is what we've seen from the beginning. But this is the problem, Ami, isn't it? Because the narrative that emanates from Palestine, the, na the narrative that emanates from Gaza, um, is absolutely and utterly um, reported as though it's fact. You know, we're, we've got um, politicians quoting in the Houses of Parliament in this country that, you know, 10,000 people have been killed, 5,000 of those people are, are children. To which I say, these are Hamas figures. These are figures coming out of Hamas, an organisation which is a disgusting... Uh, 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 medieval uh, terrorist murdering organisation. And we're supposed to believe that their statistics are correct. According to Hamas, no um, Hamas fighters have been killed in any airstrikes. Only children and only doctors and only scientists. You know, I mean, the whole thing is a joke. And even the water argument, I was told now by several Israeli government officials, the amount of water that has been stopped from going into Gaza amounts to 9% of the water supply, because 91% of the water supply emanates from inside of Gaza itself. And yet our media seems to want to be quite happy to completely to spread these ridiculous claims. Yeah, um, look, it's, uh, it's perplexing, uh, but this is, again, nothing new. We've seen this kind of media bias against Israel for years. You know, I like to play a game called Stupid or Liar, right? I mean, <laughs> it's one of the two. Uh, either they understand 
that that this like you talked to I, I was hanging out with media people I don't want to say who but major major news outlets over the last couple of days having private discussions with them and they look at me and they go I mean you they they say to me that you do agree that Israel is trying to kill civilians. I'm looking at them saying, are you insane trying to kill them? Let's assume the numbers that we got from, from Hamas are correct. They're, they're not, right? Remember, they're the ones who said within 30 seconds that 500 people died in a yeah. hospital killed by an Israeli airstrike right. when it was just a few dozen, and it wasn't by Israel at all. It was by Islamic Jihad. But let's assume for a moment that that 8,000 number, 10,000 number is correct. Okay, you have to understand that we're talking about days and days and thousands of heavy bombs dropping on the most densely populated uh, area in the world where the citizens are being used as human shields. The question is, how is it only 8,000 people, yeah. right? If Israel wanted to kill civilians for real, Mike, the number wouldn't be 8,000. It would be 800,000 immediately. Yeah. Israel could turn the Gaza Strip into glass in a day. Yeah. It chooses not to. It tries to avoid civilian casualties, but it doesn't understand that when it's attacking a terrorist infrastructure, let's say a cache of rockets that will be the next day used to rain down on Israel, it understands that sometimes, even though it goes out of its way to save civilians, it has a number of ways through pamphlets and phone calls and knocking on the roof, telling them this is a target, strategically degrading their ability to hit that cash, they still do it because that's the way, that's the ethical way the IDF involve itself in combat. Yet the media refuses to acknowledge it. Liar or stupid, that's yeah. the game I play. Well, let's talk about Anthony Blinken because he was very careful uh, at the speech he made just now uh, with Isaac Herzog uh, to, to sound as though uh, he was feeling a lot of pain for the Palestinian innocents who were dying. Now, I don't know whether he's buying the figures or whether he's buying what Hamas is saying, um, but he doesn't sound as though he has every faith in Israel to do what you've just described. Look, um, I've been a critic of, of uh, both Blinken and President Biden for a long time. Having said that, I have to say that although you see it kind of cracking now, I could not have expected Joe Biden to do a better job than he has done in terms of backing Israel, right? I really don't have a whole lot of complaints prior to the last few days. Now, you're starting to see the pressure and the cracking. I got to say, Israel finds it pretty offensive when they have to say, uh, hey, guys, conduct the war, but you got to be careful. It was like, yeah, we know that. We are always careful. This is not the first rodeo, not the first time we've gone to Gaza, right? And, and frankly, if you look at the numbers historically, it, you know, the numbers are crazy. Israel, in the most densely populated place on Earth, where they use human shields, in the past wars in Gaza, have killed one terrorist for every one civilian. I know that sounds bad, but in context, that's actually an, an, an incredibly good number. Uh, NATO, which is also very, very careful in American forces, that number in a far less densely populated place is one to three. Mm. One militant for three civilians. So Israel says, is saying to, to the president, don't, why are you lecturing us on this? It's kind of offensive to tell mm. us we have to look out for civilians. We know that and we are. So look, the pressure is ramping up for the administration. It lasted longer than I thought. I think now we're seeing that the left is getting toward them. Well, this is the thing. And I mean, we've had several headlines in this country, in London, because a lot of people have been shocked by what has been seen in London over the past two weekends. Massive demonstrations on behalf of uh, the Free Palestine movement. The police seemingly not knowing really what to do about it. And there's going to be another big one apparently tomorrow. They're calling for a million people to march. People are ripping down posters of Israeli hostages, children who are still being held in Gaza, ripping them off. The police actually taking them down because they didn't want to cause division. I mean, it's an extraordinary state of affairs. And also people, senior politicians, calling for a ceasefire while these children and their elderly family members are still being held hostage beneath the streets in tunnels in Gaza. I can't believe it. It's, it, it's sick. Mike, I want to be very clear about something. Uh, I have been to these protests over the years around the world, certainly all over the United States. Uh, I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of these people. I want to make something very clear. I know they're saying they stand with Palestine, and that's fine. Look, I get it. They're supporting Gaza. That's their people. I got no issue with that. I get it. I think they're, mis I think they're mistaken, but fair enough. 
But let me tell you something. I always ask, I ask a number of questions, but this question I always ask every single time, including during this conflict. I ask them, do you condemn the attacks, the barbarity, the savagery of Hamas? Just condemn Hamas for me, and then we can move on to a discussion about the civilians in Gaza. Mike, I have yet, out of hundreds of people, have someone look at me in the eye and say, I condemn Hamas. Never, not once. Not 5% or 10%. I have yet to come across someone who says, I condemn Hamas. That's the problem. That's what we're dealing with. And I don't feel, look, I feel it's bad enough in the U.S. You guys have it way worse than we do, yeah, right? It's really bad. Do. And I think it's only going to get worse. Well, Jewish people in London, uh, many of whom are friends of mine, uh, are saying we actually think that London right now is more dangerous than Israel for Jewish people. I, I'm not sure I would go... Well, OK, look, that, there's some truth to that in the sense um, we're not living with any Semites on the street every day, right? For the most part, these are all mm. Israeli citizens, both Arab and Jewish. People, everybody's getting along. From that perspective, sure, I, I would feel uncomfortable uh, riding the, the underground today in London, considering the videos that I've seen and the chants that I've seen and the... And the the bigotry and the bullying, uh, both cyber and physical, that I've seen. Sure, I, you know, it's counterintuitive. You know, at first I, I just said to you, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. But now that I'm thinking about it on the spot, no, that's not so crazy. It's not so crazy. Well, when you've got, you know, children um, whose parents are frightened to send them to a Jewish school, people frightened to go to a synagogue, you know, armed guards outside of synagogues, you know, I think it's a lot worse here than, than people really know. And I've been very surprised. Um, by the reactions of, of, of a lot of politicians and a lot of ordinary people. And you're right, you know, some people will even go as far as to um, condemn the attacks on October the 7th, but they won't go as far as to outlaw Hamas. They'll say that, oh, well, you know, Hamas have grown out of the, uh, the poverty uh, and, the, and the oppression uh, of Gaza, and that's why Hamas are there. You know, what about the Palestinian um, uh, leaders in the West Bank? You know, the Palestinian Authority, what are they doing? Why are they not condemning Hamas? Why are they not saying we should not be uh, siding with these people? It's a great question. I actually just came two days ago from Ramallah, where I, I spent time talking to people on the streets about the, the, the situation. Um, so those are two things. Let me, let me start with the Palestinian Authority. Um, they're not condemning it because they, they are between a rock and a hard place. Because the reality is, is that the P, if there was an election today, in the PA, and of course, this is an Arab country, they don't, don't have free and fair elections. If there was one, the polling shows that the Greens would win. Hamas would win easily. And that was, that, that was uh, backed up by my talking and speaking to people in, all, in Ramallah. Uh, they all support Hamas. Uh, I, I came across only a few older people who said they support the PA. Mm. Anybody under 50 was completely backing Hamas. And the PA understand that if they condemn this too hard, uh, they could have uh, an insurrection on their hands. Um, i got to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the PA, but they're in a very, very tough spot because Hamas has incredible, it's, it's really, it's bizarre, incredible support among the Palestinian people, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well. One final question just on something uh, back home for you. Uh, Donald Trump, we're told, will be appearing in court once again next Monday. Um, the, uh, you know, the route continues of uh, the Donald Trump years and uh, all of these crazy um, charges that he's facing, uh, which seem to only make him more popular with every single charge that lands uh, and every single indictment that gets put upon him. Um, what are you making of what's going on with the Trump kind of persecution, if you like? Look, it is very, very dangerous what Letitia James and, frankly, uh, other, other people other states have done. It's the weaponization of law. It's taking the legal system and using it as a weapon against a political opponent. That's what we're seeing in this particular case and some other cases against Trump. Um, it's a significant problem. It wasn't like you had, so you didn't, it wasn't like you had um, claimants, the banks, they say he defrauded, who came forward and said, look, uh, Letitia James, we were defrauded by the Trump administration. You go after them. None of them did that. All of them got paid back in full, happy the relationship. It didn't matter to Letitia James the AG of New York, she actually campaigned on one issue. I'm going to take down Trump, which is not exactly ethical for somebody who's one of the top legal uh, people in a state. Um, look, it's not about the, partic and look, the particulars we can go into. It's more about the danger that we're seeing. This is not a good situation when you're using law as a weapon to prosecute and persecute an individual. She has gone after not just 
President Trump, but the NRA and other conservative organizations, she has yet to go after a liberal organization that has done the same thing, right? I'm not sure either one is something that's, uh, that's legally fraudulent, but nonetheless, there are examples of liberal organizations that have done it, but she has gone after only conservative organizations. That is not a smart and not a healthy thing for a republic. No, it really isn't. I mean, listen, great to talk to you, and, and look after yourself there in Tel Aviv. Thank you very much.